Welcome to M is for the Maritimes on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Today, we are honored to have Craig Pollitt on the show. From May 2001 to December 2022, Craig was on the front lines of municipal governments in eastern Canada as the past CEO of municipalities of Newfoundland and Labrador. He left that position and started his own municipal consultant firm, Pollitt Strategies Incorporated, and just in the last couple of weeks has joined our co host Ian's firm, Strategic Steps, as Vice President Atlantic for Strategic Steps Incorporated. In today's chat, we will be chatting about municipal governments in the Maritimes. So, Craig, welcome to the Political Trenches. Let's get this chat underway with my first question, and that is, in your opinion, what is the state of municipalities like in the Maritime provinces? <laughs> flux but i bet everybody has that answer right <laughs> that's that's the generic answer anytime anybody asks anybody about the state of municipal affairs anywhere in canada almost anywhere in the world it's change it's in flux and that's absolutely the case here um nova scotia is going through all kinds of changes in terms of growth and different challenges for different kinds of municipalities new brunswick just had a tremendous uh, sort of structural reform process happen. Uh, PEI, Prince Edward Island, has newish legislation that they're grappling with and some other changes happening. And I think, like the rest of the country, municipalities more and more in this part of the world are finding themselves engaged in conversations that 10 years ago they weren't engaged in, or 20 years ago they weren't engaged in, around social issues, around housing, uh, around immigration. So it's there's a, there's a lot bubbling up all the time. So I, I, I want to get this question out of the way because I know it's on both Ian's and I's conversation mind right now. And you've mentioned three provinces in the Maritimes. You've mentioned Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. Now, when I approached you, I said uh, the Maritimes, and I added Newfoundland and Labrador. But then you correctly uh, quickly corrected me by saying, no, that's Atlantic Canada. What's the difference? So the difference is uh, Maritimes plus Newfoundland and Labrador equals Atlantic Canada. The regional reference changes to Atlantic Canada. Um, I don't know if anybody's really sure why that is the case, except for the very obvious reason that Newfoundland and Labrador didn't join Canada until 1949. And the term the Maritimes was in use for generations before that, for that very specific group of provinces. Uh, right from the early days of the country. So when 49 came along and Newfoundland and Labrador joined the country, my sense, I wasn't there at the time, despite all <laughs> evidence to the contrary, um, my sense is that it, it felt like that name was taken. And it, it really did re um, reflect a very specific group of provinces. So Atlantic Canada became the verbiage for the four Atlantic provinces. And I... We, we um, those of us from Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, almost in the same way that people from Labrador will always correct you if you say the province of Newfoundland, rightly so. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will always correct you if you refer to the Maritimes as including our province. Which I which I have noticed as well. So thank you for the initial correction, and I think I'm <laughs> uh, making, not making that mistake again, except sometimes to tweak noses. You did make a reference to, we're dealing specifically now with the Maritimes, so the three provinces. You've made reference to some of the significant flux in your word that's happened recently and is on the horizon as well. How differently do the Maritime provinces operate from one another? Um, because their relative populations are fairly small. Yeah, so legislation differs quite a bit uh, across the three Maritime provinces. Um, their systems actually differ quite a bit. So in Nova Scotia, you've got some very large um, regional municipalities, Halifax Regional, Munis uh, regional Municipality, Cape Breton Regional Municipality. These are essentially municipalities that take in what used to be counties. And then you still have, across the province, county governments, you know, the municipality of Kings County, and you have some independent municipalities within those geographic entities. So in, in Nova Scotia, for example, I think they're at about 49 municipalities. In Prince Edward Island, completely different landscape. 
uh, PEI has the newest legislation, as far as I recall, of the three. Uh, and that's the one that's getting closest to sort of enabling legislation or more permissive legislation. The rest of the legislation in the Maritime Sand in Newfoundland Labrador is quite old and quite prescriptive. But in Prince Edward Island, they've got an issue of, uh, you know, they have a few dozen municipalities. Then they have huge swaths of land with no municipal government whatsoever. It's all unincorporated land, um, which causes challenge, as you might guess, in terms of zoning and that sort of thing. And of course, New Brunswick, New Brunswick's been grappling with um, how best to take a regional approach to municipal government for quite a long time. They had a lot of municipalities, not as many as Saskatchewan, not as many as Newfoundland and Labrador, but quite a few for their size. And they've just gone through, well, in, in my, since I've been in the business, I think their third or fourth significant restructuring. And the latest one has dropped them from 107 municipalities down to 79. And they now have no sort of uh, local service districts or non-municipal entities anymore. Everybody is in something. So their legislation differs and their structures differ between the, the three quite a bit. What do you, so no, New Brunswick has moved ahead most recently. What do you think is the trigger? What was the trigger to that? And do you think it's going to happen elsewhere? Oh, absolutely. And it is happening elsewhere uh, in different forms and through different venues. Um, the trigger in New Brunswick, I think, was just they had had several. There was the Finn Commission. There were several reports that were generated that talked about efficiency, balance of services between sort of provincial and local. And was there something in between? A few years ago, they introduced um, something called a regional service commission, which delivers services, not a municipal government. It, it is a service delivery mechanism. Um, but that didn't quite go as far as I think at the time provincial government was hoping. And I think what's happening in New Brunswick now is sort of phase two of that process. And I, I think not unlike some of the stuff that's happened in Newfoundland Labrador uh, and in other parts of the country, there's a there's a, a demographic challenge, a sort of uh, economic challenge in terms of really small, really rural communities um, having to support themselves and provide services. And I, I think the New Brunswick government, provincial government, made the decision that we can keep talking about this. And there's probably lots of conversations still to happen. Uh, and we can talk about that because I'm just back from New Brunswick and had a really interesting experience there. But I think they decided to take the rip the Band-Aid off approach. They thought if we if we continue to discuss this, nothing's going to happen. So within, I think, a couple of years, they've gone through the entire white paper, green paper implementation process. And we now have all, all kinds of new municipalities with new names and new forms and new functions in the in the province. And they just they saw what was happening in terms of demographics and economics and governance and decided this was going to be their response. We uh, well, want to jump in here for a second on, on just on New Brunswick here for a second, because New Brunswick has been making the news a lot lately with the introductions introductions of Bill Forty Five at the, uh, mm. the provincial level, and I know you just said you're back, just back from uh, New Brunswick, and I just want to just ask you, how are municipalities handling this sort of? And I, I'm using uh, two councillors from St. John's's quote here: the overreach that uh, the province is. Uh, sort of putting onto the municipalities on how the governance structure looks, how uh, if a bylaw gets passed, the province has the right to overturn it if Bill 45 gets turned. Are municipalities concerned in New Brunswick? Are you hearing that? Or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know you're yeah. you laugh, but is this a big concern for <laughs> municipalities in New Brunswick? It's, it's a massive concern. And you can imagine the, the entire sector in New Brunswick, I think, recognized that something was coming, some form of regionalization or restructuring was coming. And they had sort of bought into the idea that we need a conversation about this. We need to start moving down a, a different road or a more focused road. 
And there was a little bit of a quid pro quo here, I think, my observation, is that the sector sort of went along with the reform, knowing it was going to be challenging, knowing that the province was going to push a lot of stuff, which they did, um, but that at the end of the day, they would have better resources, better reach, more autonomy to do the things that need to be done. And then right on the heels of that, the province comes in with Bill 45 and says, oh yeah, by the way, if you happen to do, and I'm paraphrasing here, but if you happen to do something we don't like, we're just going to reverse it. And it, that's not going down well in New Brunswick at all. Um, I'm an advocacy guy. That's what I've spent the last 20 years of my career doing is trying to convince federal and provincial governments, usually pretty successfully, to change their minds on things. And what's happening in New Brunswick is a classic case of municipalities having to do advocacy for themselves to make sure that their environment doesn't get changed to the point where they're hand tied. And it's, uh, it is a really interesting example in terms of, you know, you, you asked earlier about the Maritimes versus the rest of Canada. And one of the things I've noticed, because I've been all over the country through national meetings and FCN, my colleagues across the, uh, the country, the provincial governments in, New, in, in Atlantic Canada, but in the Maritimes specifically, still take a little more sort of parental role or view of their role with municipal government. Um, they like to see, I think, municipal governments as uh, awkward teenagers, and you want to give them a little more authority, but yeah, you got to keep an eye on them because you don't know what they're going to do. And every now and then, a provincial government like the one in New Brunswick will do something like Bill 45 that just really shows that that's what's happening here, right? There is a lack of faith in that order of government to deliver properly. One of the other areas I want to talk about here is Prince Edward Island. You, you, you mentioned in your, uh, your one of your answers that there's a large unincorporated area that is ungoverned right now in uh, Prince Edward Island. Um, how do municipalities in Prince Edward Island stack up when trying to fund infrastructure projects when there's a large portion of the area? And I know PEI is not that large in the grand scheme of things, but how how do you how do municipalities plan infrastructure projects when a large portion of the province is unincorporated and the province has to do the work that municipalities are supposed to. Well, everything in context, right? So yeah, <laughs> Prince Edward Island is small compared to places, uh, but they're still running a local government system and they're still running infrastructure projects and they still have some of the really, there's some really innovative stuff happening in Prince Edward Island. So Summerside, for example, um, is doing some really innovative things around energy and the electrical grid. I mean, they're a partner in the grid in their community. Um, and they're helping residents lower their electrical bills. And they've got an entire program and system built on that. So to some degree, they're just doing really cool, innovative things because they don't have access to that big swath of property. And, you know, in the municipal world, property tax is king or queen or whatever. Um, they don't have that. So they're doing other interesting things to try to get around it. But to be honest, outside of sort of Charlottetown, Summerside, the infrastructure costs to those very rural municipalities are very different than they would be in a large center. They don't have a lot of communal water and sewer. They don't have sidewalks. Uh, there's, there's still dirt roads in places. So much the same in rural New Brunswick, very much the same in, in rural Nova Scotia and in rural Newfoundland Labrador. Um, the, the access to revenue is smaller, but the need for revenue is slightly smaller. Now, that said, it's all indexed. It's all, you know, they still need more money to do the things they're doing. Uh, it's just not necessarily the crisis that land access might, might uh, make you think it is. The biggest issue in Prince Edward Island, from my experience, is how do you plan 
how do you plan municipalities and the space between municipalities when you have no authority over it and you can't touch it? I'll take a slightly different tack here. Yeah, you have a role with the Atlantic Mayor's Congress. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to talk to us a little bit about that and some of the big issues that are being seen collectively as well. So the Atlantic Mayor's Congress started back in 2001. Uh, former mayor of Halifax, Peter Kelly, convened a group of mayors, like-minded mayors from around the region. And um, I'm trying to remember what, there was an issue they were getting together to talk about. It escapes me now. And it went well. They decided we should do this every year. And that went so well, they decided we should do this twice a year. And that's been going on for the last 22 years. Um Matt Kerrigan is a gentleman that's been running that. They're sort of executive director for the last 22 years. Matt's just retired, and they quite nicely offered me the position to run this, this organization now. And at the last meeting in Amherst, Nova Scotia, I think we had 31 municipalities from the region represented by their mayor uh, or deputy mayor. And it is, it's a fascinating group because there is always, anytime you get municipal folks together, they're going to talk about roads. They're going to talk about water and sewer. They're going to talk about zoning. They're going to talk about, you know, provincial overreach into what they're supposed to be doing and funding access to revenue. My gosh, like it, you can go back 50 years looking at AGMs from some of these associations and they were talking about lack of revenue and the, the, imbalance in the revenue system between federal, provincial, and municipal. But this group also spends a lot of time sort of circling back to what I said earlier, talking about things that maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago in some places, municipalities were not talking about. So at the last meeting, there was a big discussion on guaranteed basic income and trying to pilot something along that lines in the region. Uh, there was a huge discussion on housing, uh, a big discussion on policing. I mean, policing is a hot button issue in the sector right now, right across the country with the, uh, the retro pay decision for the RCMP. And you know, there, there's a lot of municipalities across this country, Maritimes included, where they're sort of scratching their heads, looking at their budgets, thinking, well, I'm not allowed to run a deficit. And now I've got this extra multi-million dollar bill that I didn't expect. What am I going to do with this? Um, and then there was a great discussion uh, that's it's just in the news lately on the Chignecto Isthmus, which is it's hard to say, uh, but it's the little piece of land that joins Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And it is one of the only, the main trade connection or goods transfer connection between the rest of Canada and the Maritimes and Atlantic Canada in terms of road and rail. And it is the UN put out a report a few years ago that listed it as the second most vulnerable location in North America in terms of flooding, second only to New Orleans. And we all know what happened in New Orleans. Wow. Um, there are parts of this, this isthmus where the rail bed itself is the only thing holding the sea back from the entire rest of the isthmus. $50 million a day in goods goes back and forth in that one little corridor. And it's going to take 300 million bucks to fix it, to shore it up. And there's been arguments now for ages about who's going to pay for it. So the Atlantic mayors got together and said, well, at this point, we don't care who pays for it. Somebody needs to step in and do this. It's a six day payback. $50 million a day goes through here. I don't think 10 years ago you would have seen that issue dominate a meeting of municipal politicians. They've got enough of their own fires to deal with, but they're realizing now that you know they've got to deal with this stuff because it affects them, it affects their citizens, and they've got a voice. You also mentioned as one of the topics that have come around there, harassment, which is something we've concentrated on over the last little while as well. I don't know if you want to comment on that too. So there was, there's been a couple discussions about that. So at this last meeting, this was my first meeting sort of in transition with Matt. Matt is retiring and I'm taking over 
the next meeting is in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador, by the way, which will be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but harassment and civility in the municipal sector, it's been an issue with the Atlantic mayors. It's been an issue um, with all of the provincial territorial associations in the region. Most of them have had so the, you know, the municipalities, Newfoundland and Labradors of the world, Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, most of them have had big discussions or resolutions around this idea of codes of conduct, how people behave in the municipal sector, not just counselor to counselor, which is an issue, but resident to staff, for example. We've had a lot of conversations around that table about the need, unfortunately, to protect municipal frontline staff from harassment from residents uh, or harassment from campaigns or whatever. So that at this last one, at this last meeting, uh, the conversation got pretty, I don't mind saying it got pretty grim. People were sharing the kinds of emails and tweets they get on a daily basis, uh, mainly women. I mean, I don't think that should be, what comes as a surprise to anybody. They they get more of the vitriol than men do, uh, and almost exclusively from men. Um, but there was a big discussion about, well, what do we do with it? You know, we can arm our staff with tools and tactics to try to deflect and whatever. But I think there was a real desire for a bigger conversation about this affects the humans involved, right? There are there are politicians who are humans, despite what you may believe, they're actual humans with families and lives and feelings. And there are staff involved who take a lot of the brunt of this. So the conversation turned to the conference that Strategic Steps had uh, just back in April, bucking the trend. And the direction I got from this group, so my first sort of, my first uh, task assigned to me by the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, is to come to them with a proposal for a similar kind of conference in Atlantic Canada. They want to bring public attention to this. They want to bring experts in to talk about it. Um, I think for far too long, the response has been, well, you know, if you're gonna be in, if you're gonna be in politics, if you're gonna be in public life, you need to have a thick skin. And that's garbage. I mean, yes, you've gotta have a thick skin, but you don't have to suffer to violence or intimidation just because you want to be involved in public life. Um, and all that does, to be quite honest, is reduce the number of people who are willing to offer themselves for these very important positions. And then ultimately it's not good for, for society. Ian, it sounds like we're on a road trip to Atlantic Canada and the we're Maritimes here this, <laughs> next year. So uh, Ian, I'm game if you are. <laughs> um, I, wanna, mm -hmm. I wanna go to a topic that's kind of controversial but it's an important one that's going on in this country right now, particularly in Western Canada. The uh, rural-urban divide in uh, uh, Western Canada mm. is quite prominent. Um, now, in the Maritimes, and even in Newfoundland and Labrador and Atlantic Canada, are you seeing such a divide where it's the uh, rural communities versus the urban communities for funding from the provincial governments, funding from the federal governments. And I know in New Brunswick, it's even, you can even go even further down that line of the Anglophone to the Francophone communities. And then you could go even further down to that, to the Eastern communities versus the Western or the Northern and the Southern. It, it, it's a very dynamic uh, province, the New, New Brunswick, but are you seeing a divide between municipalities and that mentality of everyone should be working together, kind of growing apart when we are seeing that play out federally? Right. Um, I mean, it's definitely there. I will preface this by saying in the Maritimes, it's always been there. This is not a new thing. Uh, when you've got a province like Nova Scotia and not to pick on Halifax, but the, the fact <laughs> is you've got Do a it. very large center you know, for, oh, I love Halifax. Don't, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going there. But, you know, Halifax, there's a, the population of Nova Scotia is a million, roughly. Halifax is almost half of that. And you can't have that vast a difference between most of the communities in a province and one community in a province. 
without some sort of competition. I don't think that's, and I'm not sure how it plays out in Western Canada or in like Northern Ontario or whatever, but the municipal side of things is really just one venue, one channel where that shows up. Um, I think that debate, that divide has been there for generations. Um, I don't think it's being exacerbated necessarily by the municipal system. I'll say that. I will say um, in New Brunswick right now, there's a real challenge because you've taken a lot of folks who were comfortable in the equilibrium. Rural weren't really happy with what they were getting. Urban was never really super happy with what they were getting. And now you've jammed them all together in a single municipality. And I think theoretically the hope is they'll just have to work it out. And I'm never a big fan of they'll just have to work it out. <laughs> These are, this this is not, I used to say to, to people all the time, they would talk about, uh, you know, we, we don't need to overstructure municipal government over time, things will just adjust. And I used to think to myself, this is not moss reclaiming a burnt over section of forest. These are man-made structures that we control. It's not nature. Nature is not going to reclaim the municipal system and make everything work well. So in New Brunswick, they've got that very real challenge that they can't sort of be comfortable in their own worlds anymore because they're together at one table. And that's going to be fascinating to see how that goes out. Um, for the rest of the region, you know, in, in PEI, it's very much a municipal versus not municipal sort of dichotomy, I think. Uh, in Nova Scotia, it is rural county versus larger centers. Um, what I do find interesting about that whole process, though, is you've got organizations like FCM doing a really great job of bringing more of a rural focus to their policy material. Um, but when you look at funding, so provincial government funding, federal government funding, most of that funding outside of what we used to call the gas tax, the community building fund, I think it is now, something like that. Most all other funding is what I would call uh, competitive based funding. Municipalities compete for that money. And urban centers compete with one another. Small competes with large, small competes with small. I actually see more division coming out of that model the fact that they all have to fight with one another for scarce federal or provincial resources than the actual urban versus rural thing. So to, to sort of end my questions here, it's sort of on the same lines here, but we, we, we often lump in parts of this country together, the Maritimes, <laughs> but the issues that are happening in PEI are not the same issues that are happening in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. Yes, they're going to be similar, but they're not the exact same. You talk about housing, you talk about the fiscal framework, you talk about the universal basic income. Um, when we look at that pot of money that municipalities are sort of chomping at because there is that divide, do the maritime provinces work together? Are the Organ municipal organizations like the Union of New Brunswick Municipalities, uh, the Federation of PEI Municipalities. I, I forget right now what the Nova Scotia, I think it's the Federation of Nova Scotia Municipalities. Are they working together to not fight it out between themselves, but work collaboratively to make sure that their municipalities are well-funded? Because I recently spoke to a gentleman from PEI and he says that Two, per, two cents of the dollar is going to his municipality that he collects. And that's not a lot. And we, we talk about the fiscal framework that needs to change. Are maritime municipalities suffering because there isn't that funding model that can sustain them in the long term? I think they're definitely suffering. Um, and again, uh, like a lot of municipalities across this country, they are suffering because the fiscal framework is from the 18th century or 19th century. We're dealing with 21st century issues and governance systems. Um, but the we call them PTAs, Provincial Territorial Associations. So the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, there's three in New Brunswick. 
there's the Union of uh, New Brunswick Municipalities, there's the Cities of New Brunswick Association, and there's a Francophone Association. And then PEI has their own as well, uh, FPEIM, Federation of PEI Municipalities. They work together, and they have to. And you said early on, it's not a big region. Um, you know, population somewhere in the realm of 2 million people just for, you know, for four provinces, less than that for the three maritime provinces. So by necessity, they have to work with one another. And they do. They work with one another sort of on a board policy level. So the presence of these associations are in constant contact. They meet on a regular basis. The CEOs or executive directors of these associations are in even more constant, more frequent contact. Um, regular meetings, the, the text thread that I was a, a part of, you know, last year was probably the most popular text thread on my phone. It was burning up all the time um, because, yeah, there's a lot going on and everybody's got their own issues, but there's no point in Nova Scotia municipalities going to Ottawa, for example, and demanding something if it's counter to what New Brunswick is looking for. Um, so it's it's a very well coordinated machine. And that's been showing, I think, in the last five years or so, you can really see a difference uh, in the messaging that's coming out and uh, the results, to be quite honest. So it's I'm hoping there's a lot more of it happening. So I want to uh, end on this question, Craig, but what's next? What's next for yourself? What's next for the maritime municipalities or even the Atlantic municipalities? What's next that is on the horizon that you see coming towards uh, your communities? Uh, I think there's going to be, I think there's going to be more restructuring uh, in the region. I think New Brunswick has sort of opened a door for things politically. Um I think there's going to be more legislative change, I hope, for the better. Because uh, as I said, I think more than any other region, provincial governments in this part of the country tend to look at municipalities as something they have to watch very, very closely just in case they screw something up. So they have that sort of paternal approach. Um, I am hoping that that's moving towards change. Certainly the municipalities themselves are showing that they can manage far more. And in a lot of cases, they can manage it far better than the provincial governments. So I sort of see that shift coming. And I think at some point, a provincial premier is going to, uh, a switch is going to flick and he's going to realize or she's going to realize there's an opportunity here to build capacity that actually makes my job easier. And they will deliver better than we deliver. I think somebody's going to make do the political calculus on that and realize that there's something to be gained. Um, and I think you're going to start to see more municipalities in this region of the province doing more, you know, what we said right at the top of the discussion, more stuff that a lot of people don't think is municipal, but absolutely impacts everybody's lives every day in their municipality. There's going to be more social issues on the table. There's going to be, I, I think this guaranteed income conversation is going to really start something interesting. Uh, and there's others involved in that, obviously. But you know, to me, when there's an organization or a cause that wants change in the region, the first group they go to, to talk to, are mayors and councils. Because that's who's going to be able to change things. That's who's going to start to push things. So I, I can see um, better, better days ahead. Not that the days today are horrible, but... I think municipalities will be doing more and they'll be doing more interesting than they have in the past. That tweaks me to something actually, if I may, Craig, and that is uh, we've been following what's going on in Ontario with the strong mayor powers being, first of all, provided to Toronto and Ottawa, and now conversation about them expanding significantly beyond that. Is there any noise about changing the structure of chief elected officials in the Maritimes? No, not certainly nothing that I've heard yet. And that's not to say it isn't happening in certain circles, right. but I haven't seen any public discussion of it. I haven't heard it discussed at municipal meetings or association meetings, except most people sort of standing around 
uh, with a beer at the end of the meeting saying, are you watching what's happening in Ontario right now? Can you believe what's happening in Ontario right now? That's the main time it comes up. Um, the, the system here is still fairly straightforward. And I, I don't think there's a big appetite to, to change you know, the role of here, the role of a CAO, the role of counsel. I think we're, we're, most people would say we're, that's not our main problem. That, that's not where the, that's not where the weaknesses rest. It's somewhere else. Thanks. Greg, I want to thank you. And Ian, uh, well, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, and uh, talking about municipalities is kind of now a pastime, pastime, pastime for myself. It is uh, just it, it, great to have someone on the other side of the country who's always interested in talking about municipalities. So thank you so much for doing this. I will talk about municipalities any time somebody asks me to. I was asked the other day to write a blog on a municipal issue, on reform in New Brunswick. And they said, it's got to be 500 words. <laughs> I'm like, you're dreaming. It takes me 500 words to say hello. I'm only gotten started. So anytime I'll talk about municipal issues, it's my passion.